plants are horrible. Yes, now, pitcher plants are carnivorous plants that catch their prey in a big cavity filled with liquid. And today, we'll be discovering what pitcher plants are capable of digesting. Well, this fishbowl represents a pi pitcher plant. Yes, yes, we got there in the end. Basically, if you're a fly, you don't want to end up in there. So, hang on, pitcher plants eat flies? Well, no biggie, just don't be a fly. Right, yes, but that's not all they eat. Let's see what else is on the menu. Nah. Uh, suit yourself. Right, uh, as a starter, would the pitcher plant like a frog? Uh, you see, that's dissolving nicely. Yeah. Well, he's croaked it. On to the main course. Some of the larger pitcher plants can devour something as large as this. A juicy rat. Mm, yum, look at that. Well, he won't live to tell the tale. So, the pitcher plant likes ratty tooey. <laughs> and now, uh, Bob, for dessert? Apologies, Professor. There was nothing else scientifically correct in the props cupboard. Well, that's a relief. I've run out of animal-based uh, death jokes. No cuddly centipedes, wasps or butterflies? Really? Uh, well, uh, let's see if the other stuff's dissolved. Of course. Will you need to take me? Ah, yes, of course, Professor. Coming in. <sighs> <laughs> Robot, get me out of here! Help! Oh. One second, Professor. Oh. Ah, Help. I have just remembered my hands are not waterproof. Oh. Danger. Clear. Oh. oh, that's really inconvenient. Oh, hey, Prof. You look kind of... Buff? Ripped? Like something out of a nightmare. You're just jealous of my six-pack sunshine. Now... All you need to make a telescope are two magnifying glass lenses. That's it. Demonstrate them. There we go. Now, they make things bigger on their own, but wait till you see what they can do when you put them together. And two cardboard tubes. For the first one, you can use an old crisps tube. Yeah, I've uh, actually helped the experiment massively already by eating all the crisps. Yes. Thanks, Mark. And the second one you'll have to make yourself using card and sticky tape. And, Mark, while Bob's doing that, you can cut the end off the crisp tube so we can see through it. On it. Ideally, you should get a grown-up to do this, but unfortunately, we just have Mark. Now, slide it inside. That's right, so it fits. Uh, put some tape on it to hold it in place. Oh, that won't slide in and out. Real science. There we go. Perfect. Now, if you tape the magnifying glasses to the ends of both tubes, that's one magnifying glass. We're nailing this. I will hold it in place. Easy, easy. easy. They think they're nailing it. I think small children at home will do far better. There you go. And you have a simple telescope. Here's one I made earlier. Oh. Yeah, you didn't make that. Someone else did. Now slide the tube so the lenses move closer together or further apart to get the image in focus. Yeah. Wow. It Hello. works. But hang on. You're upside down. Ah, I'm supposed to be. That's how telescopes work. The lenses bend the light, so the image appears upside down. If you want it the right way up, you'll need an extra lens. Or just stand on your head. We're going to use our telescope to look at the stars, but remember, there's one star you must never, ever look at through a telescope. And no, it's not me, it's the sun. Because if you look at that, it'll damage your eyes, right? Exactly, Mark. So, you know, don't do it. Well, this seems like a good moment to introduce the man who invented the first astronomical telescope in history. The father of astronomy, Galileo. Here we are. Oh, oh. Oh. Cheers, Bob. So yeah. kind of you. No. Oh. Ah. Ooh. Carry on, mate. <sighs> OK. Well, today, for the big experiment, we're looking at how snot stops dust and germs getting into your body. Uh, hang on, uh, we're not going to be using real snot, are we? <laughs> of course we're not using real snot. <laughs> because you just drank it. <laughs> but don't panic, Mark. It's fine. We can make fake snot instead. You'll need some gelatin, some corn syrup. It's essentially just liquid sugar. And some green food colouring for that lovely snot colour. Yes. First of all, we need to dissolve the gelatin. This needs hot water, so get an adult to help you. Now, mix up three tablespoons of gelatin with about the same amount of water. Gelatin's going in. Mark, will you help me put 
some food coloring in here. Now, we will add three drops of green food coloring, or a few more if you want to make it very snotty. Look at this, Mark. Oh, yes. This is a lovely green snotty consistency. Now, we need to leave that to cool down. Luckily, here's some that is already cool. That was there the whole time, Mark. <laughs> now, we add six tablespoons of corn syrup. There it goes. That's all gone in. Look at that, Mark. And I'm going to mix this up with a fork. Oh, yes. Until we get these great long strands of gooey snot, Mark. That's the stuff. Yeah, no, it's not. Look how snotty that looks. You can gross out your friends and your family. Now, the second part. Join me over here, Mark. Do not be confused, Mark. This is not a real human face. It is a model I have built. We will add some of the snot to this nose. Snot goes in the nose. I'm putting a lot of snot in. There we go, Mark. Now, look what happens when I fire this vacuum cleaner bag full of dust at the snot. Ha! Wonderful. The dust and filth gets trapped in the snot. Just like the snot in your nose stops nasties and germs getting into your body. It then hardens into a nice, safe bogey. Like these I prepared for you earlier, Ma. <laughs> Lovely. Don't eat those, though. I am saving them for later. This machine generates sound, and the sounds cause this metal plate to vibrate. Now, if I sprinkle some sand on here, and turn this machine on, it will begin to vibrate. It's pretty cool. Yes, the sand has moved, as you can see. Now, if I change the sound, the vibration will change. Watch what happens. Wow. I know. 952.7. What's going to happen? It's like I'm DJing, but with sand. Yeah, it's banging. Thank you. It's not my favorite tune, but the sand seems to like it. Nice. Professor, why don't you tell us how sound waves make the sand move like that? I thought you'd never ask. It's so horrible. I'm Professor McTaggart, and this is my brain dump on sound waves. Sound waves are like the ripples that appear on a pond when you throw in a stone. They start at one point and travel outwards. But you can only hear them if there's something for them to travel through, like air or water. In space, where there's no air, you wouldn't hear anything because there's nothing for the waves to travel through. So even a heavy metal concert in space would be as quiet as a public library on a Sunday. A sound wave looks like this. A curvy line represents the differences in pressure. Sound waves can be high in pitch, like a mouse squeaking. Or they can be low in pitch, like a bear growling. Or Mark's stomach. Sound waves travel through the air to our eardrums, where we're able to hear them, which can prove very useful when there is a growling bear nearby. Always end with a joke. Hang on a sec. I thought there were some noises that humans couldn't hear. Well, well, well. Perhaps you did listen in some science lessons after all. When you weren't asleep or picking your nose with a ruler. Well, at least I've got a nose, mate. And this will probably be the only time I or anyone else will say this, but you're correct, Mark. Humans can only hear a certain range of sounds. Some noises are so high-pitched we can't hear them. Other animals can, however. Which animals? Well, Dogs can hear more high-pitched sounds than we can, which is why humans can't hear dog whistles. But the real experts are bats. They're capable of hearing the really high-pitched sounds. Turn on this machine and I'll show you. Come on, chop chop. And if you turn the dial, yes, you see, the pitch will get higher and higher until What happens? I can't hear anything. Exactly. The pitch is too high for humans to hear. Only bats will be able to hear the sound now. <laughs> wow. That's actually pretty cool. <laughs> so 
time now for us to go to... Ah, get them off me! I wasn't calling you lot. Turn it off! Turn it off! Sorry, mate. My bad. Ah, ah. Wicked! Are we making bubblegum flavoured slushies? Please, please tell me we're making slushies! Oh, I'm sorry, Mark. No, this water represents the ocean. Ah, boring, unbubblegum flavoured ocean. Mark! I mean... Incredible, awesome ocean world! Yes. And as the ocean splashes around, it absorbs carbon dioxide, or CO2 as we call it, from the pollution in the atmosphere. For thousands of years, the amount of dissolved CO2 in the air stayed roughly the same, and marine life adapted to thrive under these conditions. See? But look what happens when we add too much CO2. Right! So we are making slushies! <laughs> no, Mark. No, this is CO2, just in a frozen form. All that extra CO2 in there is making the seawater acidic. And what happens to creatures like coral when you add them to acidic seawater? They think it's awesome? No, it kills them, you nincompoop. Coral reefs are dying out all around the world. It's a terrible problem, and we all need to focus on solving it. Professor, can I do my song now? It's about the difficulties of being a robot in a human world. Not uh, just yet. Maybe later. Prepare yourself for an insane look at what they don't tell you in the science books. From inner space to the universe, we're on a case to face the worst. It's icky and it's whiffy and it's yucky and it's squishy, but we love it.